uh, annual spring uh, practice press conference, and it is uh, when I got into my car this morning at uh, early this morning, it was minus eight degrees. So uh, spring practice uh, means we're going to start indoors next week, most likely. So um, it's probably going to be that way. We're on a, uh, a tighter window relative to uh, our schedule this year uh, with, you know, the school calendar, Easter following a lot later. Um, we start spring practice as early as I can remember it. Um, on March 3rd, um, next Monday, uh, you know, taking advantage of the NCAA rule, which you don't have to count consecutive days when you have a spring break. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll practice next week twice. We'll have spring break, and then we'll be able to get the remaining 13 practices in, uh, and, and it's spread out a little bit better than trying to get all 15 in after spring break. Uh, with obviously trying to finish up before Easter. So that's the reason why we, uh, we tried to stretch out spring ball a little bit longer uh, because of the way the schedule fits this year. Um, so for those that were um, wondering why we started a little bit earlier this year. Consequently, it's changed a little bit of the way uh, we went to work uh, in the weight room, uh, in our conditioning elements. Um, we were on a, a more accelerated pace uh, to get our guys ready for practice. And so this week has been uh, a lot of our eight hours. You know, we've taken some time in there to really spend some time with our players as well. So uh, we've taken a little bit off of the weight training uh, this week and, and, and been able to spend some time on, um, you know, conditioning elements that will get our players ready for spring practice next week. We don't want to use our two practices next week to get our guys ready and, and, and in football shape per se. So we really want next week to be two very good practices for us. So um, I guess, again, a lot of the things that I'm saying right now is to say that uh, this spring practice is a little bit different in the management than, than other years. And, Quite frankly, it's, it's, um, it's different than any one that I've experienced in, in my 25 years as a head coach. So uh, it's exciting in that sense because there's a new twist to it for everybody. As well as we've got some new coaches and uh, some new assignments. Uh, as you know, Coach Van Gorder on the defensive side of the ball, uh, his, his uh, coordinating efforts will, um, will continue to uh, bring both three down and four down. Uh, as part of what we do defensively, but certainly his personality will come out, uh, and uh, his personality is, is different than what Coach Diaco brought. I, I wanted, when I hired Bob to come here, we needed to build consistency and stability uh, with our defense, um, and, and he certainly uh, answered the, the, the charge that I had given him. Um, we needed fundamentally sound defense, and we got that from Coach. Uh, we have a great base, and we have now uh, developed um, uh, what we consider a demeanor on our defense and an expectation. Uh, and now we're going to take it to the next level defensively. And, and Brian's going to be able to take our defense to that next level. Uh, and I think that that's what you'll see uh, in, in what Coach Van Gorder will bring to our defense. Um, third down packages, uh, we'll be able to use personnel uh, uniquely different in certain areas, uh, but at the end of the day, this is still about keeping the points down, um, taking, taking the football away, and, and eliminating the big plays. He'll, he'll coach the, uh, the inside linebackers, um, but uh, what, what, what Brian likes to do is have the ability to move around defensively, so Coach Bob Elliott will have the outside linebackers, but We'll also have an expertise in all of those linebackers, so it'll give Brian the opportunity to move around a little bit uh, during practice um, and, and really have his hands in uh, everything that's going on, and in particular uh, in the back end of our defense because um, our corners, our safeties, all of them will be very much involved in, in what we do defensively, not that they're not involved in every defense, but uh, they'll be very active in what we do defensively. So. Uh, that allow Brian to have uh, uh, a lot of flexibility during the practice. Uh, Kerry Cooks will have 
uh, the entire uh, back end. Um, and um, I, I think, you know, we feel very good about, um, you know, adding, um, you know, that addition to his um, responsibilities uh, back there. Um, you know, Kerry's a very accomplished coach. He, he had a co-coordinator's role for us. Now his focus will be uh, in particular uh, on the back end of, of the defense. And uh, as you know, we've got a graduate assistant back there. And, um, and uh, McCarthy is uh, a guy that uh, not only played here at Notre Dame and, and got a chance to play in, in the NFL, um, but when we interviewed him and I interviewed him, he, he's a guy that can stand on his own two feet in front of a room. Uh, and he can coach. And uh, even though he's labeled as a graduate assistant, we feel like he's a guy that can really go back there and coach, um, you know, at a high level. So we really think that, you know, we're really strong uh, with, with uh, the addition of McCarthy on our staff as well uh, and gives us a lot of flexibility with uh, Coach uh, Elliott down with the linebackers and, and now uh, Coach Van Gorder being able to float a little bit. And, of course, Coach Elston will, will handle the front. So that's how we see the, the defense uh, and, and uh, how we're structured. And, Co and uh, Coach Eastant uh, will be the graduate assistant working primarily um, with, with the front. On the offensive side, um, you know, Coach LaFleur uh, is our new coach on the offensive side of the ball, working with the quarterbacks. And, uh, you know, we've been able to have a number of meetings and, and really excited about, you know, his uh, ability to, to come in seamlessly and communicate with the quarterbacks and, and, and with Coach Dembrock as our offensive coordinator. Uh, and it's been a really good, uh, you know, two, three weeks of meetings. Uh, he's immediately, uh, you know, I thought added a lot to, to our meetings in terms of what we're doing offensively and again knows our system very well. So he'll have the quarterbacks. Um, Coach Dembrock will coordinate and have the receivers um, and, and, and Coach Alford will, will focus primarily with the, with the running backs um, and you know won't have to worry as much about slots and running backs. He'll be focused mostly with just the, the running back position. Uh, Coach Booker will be with the tight ends. Um, Coach Eastant, obviously, uh, with the offensive line. Um, and, uh, you know, we've hired a couple of, you know, obviously, uh, you know, a graduate assistant in, in Mahaffrey on the offensive side of the ball who was a tight end uh, a coach who gives us a lot of versatility uh, and, and expertise. Um, and I love the fact that he can be both in the passing game and the running game. So uh, really, really a good staff and, and uh, really like the last two, three weeks in terms of our working. So a little bit unique in terms of uh, the, the spring model. Um, getting our new coaches uh, uh, going uh, has been really uh, you know, fun from my standpoint. And then the big thing. Uh, putting this football team together. That's what this is about. Uh, 2014, once we got off the road, was, was putting this football team together. And, you know, here's where we are. We're, as I look at it, we're a talented football team, but inexperienced in, in a number of areas. Um, and it's our job to, to uh, get those inexperienced players ready to play. And uh, this is the time to do it. So those inexperienced players are, are getting coached. Uh, they'll have an opportunity in the spring to, to get some opportunities to compete and get this football team um, experienced uh, to the point where they can go out there and, and um, compete with a very, very uh, challenging schedule in 2014. Um, I think the last piece for me and then we'll open it up to questions, is that, you know, when you're putting together your football team, you know, you're, everybody wants to talk about leaders. Um, we we got to talk about how to get our guys, uh, first of all, uh, to, to lead within their units first. You know, they got to be able to lead within their position group. 
And then after they lead within their position group, they've got to be able to lead on their side of the ball. And when they can lead on their side of the ball, then they can lead the football team. And so the steps that we've been taking over the last few months have been to put them in positions to lead within those subgroups. And, and then we'll have a better understanding of who our leaders are. So that's kind of the, the lab work or the, you know, the microcosm of what's going on building the team right now. And then we'll, we'll take that out onto the field. So I'm excited about having practices so I can see that happening. So I'll be seeing it and talking about it as we kind of go through spring ball and we'll know a little bit more about our football team and who those leaders are going to be. With that, I'll open it up to questions. Uh, Brian, with Everett specifically, when you're talking about leadership, what did you hear about him from the workouts, and what do you want to see from him in spring practice to see that he can take that next level as a leader? Well, we're part of the workouts, so I've been there, uh, and you know he, uh, you know, the one thing with Everett is is he's a hardworking kid. You know, he's always been that way since he's been here. He's uh, you know, it's, it's, it's never been a question about his work ethic. Um, I think the quarterback, just by its position, uh, is going to be a leader. So what, what we're working on with Everett is just consistency. You know, I think if you look at, you know, the watchwords for leadership, you know, I think the first thing is compete. And I've already answered that question. He's a great competitor. I think the second thing is consistency. Well, he hasn't shown that yet, right? So we're working on that consistency end of things. The third thing that I look for is great communication. And, and we're doing a really good job of communicating uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And the fourth thing is being coachable. Uh, I think those four things are what I look for from every one of our players and I like where we are in that process with Everett right now. And what are your thoughts on the proposed 10-second rule? Um, that seems to be pretty controversial. Well, you know, you'd have to show me data that if this is about player safety, I haven't seen any data that really goes to the heart of that. Um, if there was compelling data, then I could probably intelligently answer or vote for it one way or the other. Um, but when I was in the head coaches meeting at the AFCA conference in Indianapolis, it was pretty clear that when rules were talked about, they were talked about with an emphasis this year about player safety. And then this rule was brought up as a point of emphasis for player safety, and there was nothing attached to it with player safety. So it was just the 10 second rule, and it's about player safety. So uh, I would not be in favor of it if you can't show me that there's no data that, that goes to the heart of player safety. And so that's kind of where I stand on it. So I did not vote for it um, because it, it did not have any data attached to me t for me to be able to, to say I'm in favor of it because of that. Thank you. Brian, to your right, all the way over. Hmm. Just a couple of position switches, the most notable. I don't know if it's official or not, but Nick Martin's listed as a guard tackle. Nick Martin is? Yes. Oh, OK. All right. Less of a uh, he's the center. Less notable than the rest of the way through. We were so. just trying to see if you were paying attention. Yes. <laughs> Less notable. Very good. Than <laughs> would be Matthias Farley is. He gets pizza, of... <laughs> Chad. Make sure he's on the pizza list. We're doing a new thing this year. I didn't. Did he tell you? Chad didn't tell you. You get pizza for great questions. Right, good. Well, then they've got two more. Matthias Farley uh, list, <laughs> listed as a corner. And... No, he's the he's the center. He, did it say C? That's a quick paced offense you're looking for. Them. <laughs> yeah, we've moved them out to corner. Uh, we're going to give them an opportunity to play corner. Um, you know, we really like, you, you know, w one thing about uh, Farley, and, and as we've looked at the depth that we, we have back there, is that 
the one thing that we're looking for and Coach Van Gorder's looking for is outside in players and inside out players at that position. And, and we think that he can be a very good player and especially a tackler from an outside in position. He's been playing inside out, right? He's been running the alley inside out. We think he can be a very good force player from an outside in position. And he's, and he's really a good athlete. He can run and he's got very good ball skills. So we're gonna give him an opportunity out there to compete and, and take a look at him. We're gonna play more than two corners. We're gonna play as many as four. Um, so uh, we're gonna take a look at it this spring. And I think the, from the other side of scrimmage, James Onwalu was listed as a safety, moved over from wide receiver. Yeah, um, you know, again, that was a tough one for me because he's so valuable offensively in a number of ways. You know, we only, you know, I think he only had three catches, but every one of those catches, um, you know, were tough catches. Uh, and, he's, and he's such a, a consistent player and he loves to compete. But he's got great contact skills. He's a ferocious competitor. Um, and I wanted to take a look at him because he is such a physical player. Uh, and he's got an incredible volume to him in terms of his ability to play every play. So uh, this was the time to take a look at him at safety. Anybody else? My intro was so thorough. I've written every story for you. Coach, you talked about the, um, the, the needing more experience. Where are you most concerned about uh, the experience, lack of experience? Well, I mean, you know, quarterback, you know, I mean, I think at that position, you know, Everett has to continue to, to, to evolve. Uh, Malik is, hasn't stepped on the field. And then, you know, Deshaun Kaiser is going to come in with, um, you know, no experience. So, you know, the quarterback position, just start right there. Um, you know, that's a position that needs seasoning. Um, defensive line. You know, we're going, to be, we're going to be young there. And then inside linebacker, you know, we're going to be young there. Uh, I think we've got some talented players, uh, but we're going to have some, some inexperienced players um, uh, at, that, at that position in particular. Uh, I think I would probably highlight those three. And talk about the, the defense. How do you expect the defense to look different this year? Well, I think... Th at first glance, the birds are going to line up the same way. You know, I mean, if you just generally speaking, it's going to look like what it's always looked like. But, you know, just like Coach Martin calls plays a little bit different than Coach Kelly calls plays, <laughs> Coach Van Gord is going to call plays a little bit different than Coach Diaco calls plays. Um, and, and so I think you're going to see a different flavor there. Um, knowing that at the end of the day, from an offensive standpoint, score points, take care of the football defensively, keep the points down, and don't give up big plays. Um, but so there'll be a different personality, and, and uh, getting to that end, I think you're going to see Coach Van Gorder's personality will come out in the defense a little bit different than, than Coach Diaco's. But, you know, it's it, again, it's going to be a, a three down, four down. Um, hybrid of both of those defenses um, working together. And uh, last week uh, down in Indy, Prince Jembo talked about uh, what happened and said that you advised him not to uh, talk about it. You just explain why you thought it was best that he not uh, address that issue? Well, that was a collaborative decision. I, I don't make any decisions independent when it comes to um, you know, major decisions at this university. The head football coach works in concert with our administration. So you know, we made a decision based upon the information that we had that um, we felt that it was in Prince's best interest that, that um, you know, this was not a matter that needed to be discussed, but that was certainly something that he could have decided to, to discuss. I mean, we didn't threaten him with, uh, no, he couldn't play or, we were going to put him on the bench or throw him out of school. He still, it was of his decision. But in talking to his parents and talking to Prince, um, we felt because of the, uh, the information that we had in front of us that, that it was a matter that, um, that, that be left um, alone at the time. Sure. Brian Top, middle. 
who do you anticipate being the candidates to replace Zach Martin at left tackle? Well, I think you start um, with, with those guys that are long enough to play out there. And we, we like to be a little bit longer. Um, you know, Elmer, uh, Stanley, uh, McGlinchey, uh, Lombard. I think you start with those four guys. Um, and, and, you know, look, I'm not, I've never bought in, Tim, to the, the, the philosophy of the blind side, left tackle, protecting. I think it's more of a, of a, a point of discussion if you're a direct snap team where you're a five and seven step drop team. We're rocker three step. And, and so, you know, we're 1.2 to 1.6 ball out. So, you know, the left has never been a huge deal for me. It's been more of a comfort of stance. And, and, and so we're probably going to go with who's more comfortable in the position. Um, you know, if you're, if, if you're talking about uh, the next level, at the NFL level, I would say that, and I, I couldn't pull all GMs, but there's probably more of a feeling that left tackle because of more direct snap in the NFL, but they're even moving away from that a little bit as well. Um, so long story short, um, most experienced, most athletic, you'd say, oh, it's Ronnie Stanley, you know, immediately. But for most comfort and who's been on the left side, you know, you probably say, you know, you, you go with the guys that have already been over there, you know, Elmer. So we'll probably go through the spring and, and um, you know, look at both of those before we make that final decision. When you recruited Elmer, did you envision the left tackle spot for him? Or not necessarily? Not necessarily. And, and I think when they come through the doors, Again, to be you know, honest with you, we, we don't peg a guy and say, that's the left tackle. We say he's a tackle, more so than we say he's a left tackle versus a right tackle. Though there, there, are, some, there are some intricacies of being in a left-handed stance versus a right-handed stance, quite frankly. Uh, and, and we have to look at that relative to the recruiting. In the fact you have a left-handed quarterback kind of throws that left-right tackle thing off. A little too. bit, yeah, a little bit. And again, the gun does make a difference. And if you're moving the pocket more, um, you know, it, it really lessens it a little bit even more. And, and how do you see Ishak Williams' role evolving again with a new coordinator and some new ideas? Does he play with a hand on the ground more? Uh, how do you see his role? Well, I think, again, If, if, if we just looked at Prince Shembo last year, okay? Prince Shembo played with his hand on the ground a lot, <laughs> right? I mean, you, you didn't think, I mean, the first thing I didn't think of Prince Shembo was dropping into the weak flat and being a playmaker. He's coming off the edge. That's how I see Eshack playing as well. I don't see him dropping in the flat, though he's better in coverage than Prince was. Um, but he's, he's going to be a guy that, that has his hand in the ground. But we want to be able to obviously mix things up and, and have him drop so you don't know where, you know where we're coming from. But just where we are right now, he's a senior. And he's a different guy than he's ever been since I've been here. Um, now, I'm not saying that that's going to translate into 12 sacks and He's going to be an All-American, but he's a different guy than at any time since I've been here. And w it, listen, it's February, okay, and things can change. But um, we have a thing called tire war where we really test the guys out competitively, and I've never seen him compete that way. And he's one athletic big dude, and we've been waiting and waiting like you all have been waiting, and I'm pretty excited right now. So we'll see. It's early. Um, I'm going to be very uh, cautious, but I'm cautiously optimistic. Thank you. Brian, you would be disappointed if I didn't. Yes. And I, I need to know your injury status as well. Uh, I am fine. I had five days of skiing in Deer Valley, and uh, I did not get hurt, um, which is a miracle. 
with my three crazy kids. So I'm happy but to be on the Can you kind of give us a review of who's definitely out of contact? Um, and I know Barati was kind of on the fence. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, he, he's going to be involved in a lot. We're, let's put it this way. He's going to be able to be evaluated fully even if he is limited in some degrees relative to the contact. So I'm not worried about Barati. Uh, I think he's, he's, he's clean in the sense that he's going to do everything. Maybe we, maybe he doesn't, uh, maybe we put a red jersey on him in the spring game or something. But he's, he's going to be involved in everything. So I, I would take him out of it. Hounchell's in. Um, uh, Randolph's in. Uh, Martin will not contact. But he's going to do everything against air. He's made incredible progress, incredible healer. He's just, you know, one of those natural deals where his body has healed incredibly well, um, as well as counsel. He'll be doing some things in the spring against air, but will be non-contact, so won't, won't be involved in a contact situation. Um, Butler will be out. He had the latest of the shoulder uh, surgery, so he's the furthest behind uh, relative medically than, than anybody that we have. And Jarrett Grace is making slow progress, um, and it's all about the healing of that, that, that fracture that he had. Uh, ligaments, tendons, all that's good. Uh, it's, it's the leg, so he would be out of uh, spring ball relative to contact. So... Um, Butler, Grace, Martin, uh, Council, um, those guys would definitely be out. Springman? I would say he's out right now. Um, he's made really good progress. When, obviously, you got a chance to work with Everett. When he came back to you, who, who was he? I mean, was he a better player than... He was when you left off last. Was he the same guy? I mean, what what did you see about him walking in the door? I, I we can't see him throw the ball yet. Okay. We, we'll know. I'll know that on um, Monday. Um, all I can see him is move. So his moving. He's a bigger kid. He's thicker. So his moving skills have not changed. Um, in in our dialogues relative to football. Uh, he has definitely a higher IQ as it relates to uh, what we're talking about from a football standpoint. You know, I could talk to him about things that um, I didn't believe I could talk to him about relative to protections, hot routes, uh, just the nuances of the passing game. So uh, clearly he has evolved there, his, his size, his strength, he did 30, he did 30 pull-ups the other day. He's way ahead of the group in terms of his physicalness, but I haven't seen him throw the football yet. You mentioned Eshack and, and maybe being excited about where he's headed. Are, are you, have you kind of identified where the pass rush is gonna come from, maybe beyond him, because you lost a lot of guys that were pretty good pass rushers? Yeah, I mean, clearly when you lose, you know, you know, two guys in particular, uh, but, you know, I mean, we got most of our pass rush from Shembo and to it, right? Um, you know, we think Eshack can certainly do it. We think Sheldon Day can be a guy that can give us a pass rush, and, you know, we're going to have to find another guy or guys that can, you know, bring some pressure. And I think that that's what I was saying earlier is that, Coach Van Gorder, with his experience, is, is going to be able to find uh, a way to, to get pressure on the quarterback. Um, and and that's, you know, that's what his experience in, in the NFL and, and uh, his length of experience in college football is going to allow us to, to find ways to get guys involved to get that pressure. I really would tell you that right now as I stand here, uh, that's not my biggest concern. Um, we're, we're going to have, um, we're going to have enough ways in our sub packages, um, that we're going to be able to find ways to bring pressures, uh, that we haven't been able to bring before. I think the question, biggest question I get in the off season is about special teams. And I'm curious, 
what your thought is the way you came out of the season and what's your approach as you move into the spring with them? Well, we went out and clinicked. Um, you know, I won't tell you where we went, but we went with some NFL and some college programs and we took our film with our hat in our hand and said, what are we doing here? What, what are we missing? And uh, primarily it was, um, you know, it wasn't scheme as much as it was some coaching points and uh, moving some personnel around, some speed players versus some power players. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we've got a better feel for the positioning of the players in the right positions. Um, so, um, you know, we're going to make some adjustments to some of the looks that we have in our punt and punt return. Um, we think we've answered some questions in our coverage teams. And like I said, you know, it's unacceptable to be where we are. Uh, we went out with um, um, that sense of being very uh, open to all things as it relates to special teams because we've got to get better there. Uh, and I think we, uh, we, we picked up some things that I think can really help us. The start and stopping in the spring practice, obviously these guys have spring break. Do you, is your expectation that they're all going to hang out here and work out during their spring no. break? Okay. No, I'm okay with them leaving, but they also know, um, you know, we don't have a lot of guys that if you look across the board, really, that say, that's my position and nobody can beat me out. You know what I mean? We don't have that. Last year, maybe we had it and the year before. But they know that they better be ready to come back, ready to go. And that message was, you know, we knew what our schedule was about a month ago. So um, they know what they need to do. They get away from, from the university, and, uh, but, but they have to be sharp when they come back. And... Uh, you know, that's one of the things that you've got to do when you trust your team, that they understand how important it is for them to get some time away, uh, but be ready to go when they come back as well. Last thing for me, I, I know it's somewhat of an older issue now, but, um, you know, the young man at Northwestern that was trying to get the union sure. going, did you take the temperature of your team about the issues that, he wanted to express with regard to the union do you feel like it's something that you need to be concerned about or need to talk to your team about at Notre Dame no, I chose not to talk about it with our team I've talked about it with our staff and certainly our administration and, and Jack Swarbrick we've had a conversation about it because it's it's real it, it, it would affect if the National Labor Relations Board finds that at private universities that student athletes are workers, it has a substantial impact. Um, now, my, my take is if it turns out that way, we're gonna have a significant advantage over every program in the country because I don't think we're dropping football anytime soon here. Um, so we're going to pay compensation we're going to pay all those things and i think our scholarship stands by itself add that to it um i, I think we're in a pretty good situation i don't think the ncaa is going to allow that to happen <laughs> i'm sure as heck michigan's not going to allow that to happen uh, so i think there's so many hurdles here that i didn't think it was the time or the place to bring it up to our team because i just think it's there's so many hurdles there before it gets to them, but it was a discussion that I had with our athletic director and our staff, just because if it was brought up by a parent or was brought up by somebody that we were all of, of the same opinion, and that is, as we stand right now, we believe that the value of a degree from Notre Dame um, stands by itself, and that that should be um, just compensation for uh, the time that a student athlete gives to to Notre Dame. Ryan, just to follow up on Eric's special teams question, you sort of coached that different ways, had one guy in charge of the whole thing, broken it up by assistant coach. How, how do you see that? It's, it's, you have to, you, you gotta have one voice, but it's all gonna have 
hands on it from all the coaches, including myself. So everybody will be involved. I was involved in, in uh, the off season in terms of you know reaching out to coaches and talking to coaches. So we're we're all involved in it, and um, you know, and I think that's the way. That's the best way to do it um, from my perspective. Um, you know, when you're talking about nine coaches. You mentioned leadership and you're open about putting guys in position just to be leaders of their position before they yes. take on a bigger. How do you do that? I mean, what are some of the specific things you do to get guys to figure out how to lead? Well, I think when, what, what we do is in our conditioning, we, we break them up in, into some units. And within those units, we, we want to hear, we want to hear them talking within those units, making sure that people are doing it the right way. Hand behind the line, finishing the drill. If somebody's bent over and not showing the right demeanor, making sure that they do that, never show fatigue. You know, those guys that are communicating that way, we reinforce that. And, and we try to use the right buzzwords, keep competing, you know? Um, and, and I think that's what we're doing right now. You know, we're trying to build that. And if that unit's not doing well, we, 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 we point it out. And, and, and we make sure that that unit is penalized as a unit, not as an individual. So if the offensive line's not, if one player in the offensive line is not doing it the right way, the entire offensive line gets penalized. That starts to get the entire unit um, to start thinking outside of just themselves. So those are the ways to try to cultivate that. Do you pinpoint the players that you want to be leaders, or do you sit there and listen and then go back and talk to the guys you think are naturally sort of bubbling up? Well, in an ideal world, in an ideal world, you want your best players to be your best leaders. I mean, that, that's, that's what you'd like. Sometimes that's not the case. So you, you, you observe uh, you know, daily and find out who those guys are, and, and you, you try to cultivate those individuals. I think with this group in 14, our best players can be our best leaders, and they may not all be seniors. And I think we've got some great seniors. I think all of our seniors are committed, um, but we may have some great underclassmen that are great leaders too. One in particular, Jalen, would jump out from sort of a natural leadership ability What's, I guess, what do you want to see from him this spring in terms of leadership? Well, as I said, you know, one of the things that makes a great leader for me is consistency. You know, I think everybody talks about the sophomore slump, you know, and um, I think one of the things with him is consistency, you know, being able to do it again. Um, and I think the other thing is um, you can pile a lot of work on him you can keep piling on it and just bring it on. Um, he hasn't been able to, to bring anybody with him yet. You know? So that's the next thing that we'll be working with Jalen is to, is to bring some guys with him. And uh, the Larry Bird rule that I use all the time is make others around him better. He's not there yet, uh, but that will be the next, next stage for him. Just a, a couple kind of personnel guys. Could you just sort of your early impressions or you know, what you've heard about Trombetti and Brent, and then I think you'd mentioned Luke Massa was going to come back for fifth year. I don't see him on the roster. Is he, is he back or did he decide to move on? Okay, so Trombetti, uh, really like uh, his motor, his athleticism, um, comfort level, he's doing well in school, uh, simulating very well. Uh, so my evaluations of him are a little bit different than the rest of the team as a mid-year guy. Same thing with Brent. Really like both of those guys, uh, the way things are going for them as mid-years. Uh, Trombetti had a great day yesterday and really showed himself. He's got a really good first step. Um, just going to be strength and size with him. Brent is a physical, uh, you know, he just looks like an upperclassman. He has a problem with right and left right now. Um, he thinks right is left and left is right. We had a drill yesterday and he went left and he was supposed to go right and he ran into Chris Brown and I think he took Chris Brown's head off. We had to put his head back on yesterday. He's such a powerful kid. So when we get right and left figured out with him, we're gonna be good with him. But physically he looks great. 
he's doing great things for us. So I like both those kids a lot. Um, and then Luke is not coming back for his fifth year. We had gone back and forth, and you know he really thought about it, and he's got a great opportunity for an internship that's going to lead into a, a job offer. And, he's, and I said, look, you, you can't turn that down. So um, as much as he would have done anything we've asked him to do, he's got a great opportunity to, to start his career, so he's going to do that. Thanks. Coach, over here, Coach, to your right. Uh, inside linebacker is a position in particular. You lose Fox, you lose Calabrese, and Grace's availability this spring probably will be minimal. Are you looking for any other bodies to help there, or is it pretty much more Schmidt, Michael Deeb? Uh, yeah, right now uh, that would be the case. You know, um, Randolph, you know, is, is playing some well. Um, you know, so I, I think, you know, those, those guys will be the ones that you see, you know, during the spring ball. And, you know, we'll, we'll kind of sort it out when we go into the fall. Um, we're still, you know, that's, that's still a, a position that's in flux for us. Um, but we'll, we'll sort that out because Grace is injured. You know, he comes back in the fall. Uh, and then we've got some young guys coming in as well. So, you know, I, I think this spring will be, like I said, the inexperience at that position will allow me to answer the question as to, you know, what that depth looks like, you know, as we move through the spring. That'll probably be the one question that I'll get asked and, and have to answer the most probably in the spring. Is Randolph moving permanently to Will, or will he also be outside? Nah, we'll probably take a look at him inside to start. Okay. I noticed John Turner was listed at linebacker. Is that a drop or...? Is yeah, that... he's gonna he's gonna play to the field, you know. So you know that's more playing to the drop position, um, you know. Uh, excuse me, he he, he would play, uh, you know, what we're calling the drop Sam position to the field. Uh, Amir Carlisle is listed as both running back receiver, whereas the other running backs are just listed there. You're trying to find some answers at the slot position, right? Uh, w with him. Yeah, I want to. I want to get them. You know, we got a we got a good stable of backs there, and I'm just trying to get guys reps. And you know, we don't have as much depth at that position, so I want to take a look at him at, at some slot receiver too. So we'll, we'll we'll get a chance to get some reps with him too. And will Mahone stay in that slot as well? Or? Right now, yes. Okay. Didn't have a chance to comment on Cody Riggs, the situation where he will be entering school. Are you looking maybe more in the future of bringing in? those potential fifth-year athletes to add? And will he be looked at specifically at the corner position? Um, it, relative to fifth-year guys, um, you know, I, I don't think it's – I think it's case by case. It's got to be the right fit, the right situation. Um, you know, there's, there's got to be, for me, a lot of – a lot of the boxes have to be checked for that to work, um, you know. There, there was there was a scholarship. There was a need. There was a connection. Um, he was the right fit. You know what I mean. All those things would have to, you know, come up the right way uh, for us. You know. So I don't know that. It, I wouldn't read too much into it. I, I don't think it means oh, Coach Kelly's going to take a fifth-year guy every year. We may not take another guy for ten years. You know. Um, I just think that in this particular instance, it was the right fit for us, and. Um, and when I looked at the merits of it, um, it was the right thing to do for our football team at this current situation. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at him at corner, but obviously he can play safety for us too. Uh, he can play nickel. You know, it's hard to find those guys that can play inside. <laughs> you know, that's, that nickel position is one of the most difficult ones to, to find. I mean, the guys in the NFL are, you know, I was talking to Coach Belichick. I mean, they took them, I don't know, six, seven years, I think six years to find a shutdown corner. You know, it's hard to find those guys. And, you know, to find a guy that can play inside and outside and can play safety, those are very valuable players. And, and so Cody is an extremely valuable asset, um, even though it's a one-year asset for us. Is there anyone else you could see kind of having that inside-outside role? Maybe a Matthias or yeah, Matthias a Col got Coluke? 
Matthias, um, Matthias right now would be the net. That's why we want to see him on the outside because we think he may have that that versatility as well. Absolutely. And just uh, with the players that were injured, guys like Springman and Houndshell, Martin, were they able to still partake in winter conditioning, yeah. with lifting, and all, all the other aspects? Yeah, we, our Either philosophy is you hurt a body part, not your entire body. So if you hurt your shoulder, we're doing everything else with you. I mean, everything else is functioning, we're moving you. I mean, your body parts are moving. Um, you know, if, if you have surgery on your shoulder, um, you know, we, we've got you in there, you know, moving your lower body, you know, once the pain medication wears off. So um, we're aggressive in terms of, you know, you have an injury to a body part, you know, obviously we're going to go through the, the normal protocol there, but no, they're, they're moving through, through the rehab very aggressively. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We're not concerned that he won't be ready, uh, but it is one that, that requires a great amount of patience because you're dealing with, you know, we're so conditioned to deal with a timetable on uh, shoulders, knees, you know, it's, it's six weeks, it's four months, it's five months. It's like Torrey Hunter Jr. with, with the, the, uh, the fractured, you know, um, bone, the healing time, it's, it's individual. And so we think we're going to be fine, but you have to be patient with them. So, you know, it's hard to throw that timetable out. We don't think that there's going to be a problem. We took a bone scan. Everything looks like it's moving in the right direction. It's just one of those slow moving processes. But we believe that there's not going to be any uh, roadblocks for him to be ready for, for the fall. Brian, over here. A different spring with just two scholarship quarterbacks. How important is this spring just for Malik specifically? And I mean, is it going to be 50 50 for the most part? Huge, wise? huge spring for Malik Zaire. Huge. He's got to step up, he's got to show a maturity level um, in terms of leadership, taking over the offense. And he's got to practice as if he's the starter. You know, he's no longer, you know, hey, Malik, go take a couple of reps here. You know, he's got to practice with a vision of him being the starter against Rice. And that's the way he's going to be evaluated every single day. You're the starter against Rice. In front of him, Matt Hegarty, a guy who played center at the end of last season. How do you look at him this spring as a guy who's probably going to fill in for Nick Martin but could possibly be used down the road in 2014 next one? Uh, we're very, very fortunate. Um, he has made incredible strides. Um, you know, here's a kid that almost was ruled out of playing football. Um, you know, we were just commenting on him in workouts the other day that last year at this time, we had serious question marks about, you know, what his level would be here. And uh, now we see him go through workouts and he's leading and communicating and uh, just he's, he's, you know, to have a guy like that who's had you know, competitive snaps um, and uh, going to have all of them again all spring. It's, that's a good situation for us to be in. Have you been in touch with DeVaris Daniels? I'm not sure what the communication you're yes, allowed with. Yes, I have been. What is the on track to come back this summer, this fall? What, what do you gather from that? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously uh, his situation was that, you know, he's not ineligible by NCA standards. This is an academic situation within the university. Um, you know, which is obviously um, outside my purview to, to comment on. Um, but um, you're welcome. Um, so from that standpoint, he'll be, uh, as long as he takes care of, uh, you know, the admissions process and getting back and he's readmitted, he'll be back here this summer. Now he's got to take summer school when he gets back here and he's, he's got to, get his classes taken care of, and as long as he takes care of his classes this summer, he'll be eligible for all the games next year. You mentioned Massa not coming back. Does that open up 84 now, scholarship-wise? 
You know what? <sighs> I'm, I, you know, sometimes I, I can't keep track of all those numbers. And Lombard, is he clear for the spring? Yes. Yes, okay. he is. Thanks. Yep. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.